this is the text where, and I'll get into it in a lot more detail on Sunday morning as we break into chapter 12, but uh, this is the text where Mary, Mary, the mother or the brother of, uh, sister of Martha and Lazarus, um, is anointing Jesus' feet. It's also recorded for us in Matthew 26, Mark 14. But the account of the woman who anointed Jesus' feet in Luke 7 is a totally different account, so don't get confused by that. Matthew, Mark, John all record Mary anointing Jesus' head and feet that night. But the Luke 7 account is a different woman entirely. Although she's in Simon the Pharisee's house, and here Mary is in uh, Simon the leper's house, who was cleansed, who was healed. Simon was a very popular name, so don't be confused by the fact that both of them were in a Simon's house. In Luke 7, the woman was from the Galilee region, north of Nain. Uh, In this account, she's in Judea, not in the Galilee region. So there are two different accounts. Although there's all four Gospels record the anointing of Jesus by a woman, three are the same woman. It's Mary from Bethany in Mark and in Matthew and in John. In Luke, it's an entirely different woman. Okay? I don't want there to be any confusion about that for you. So it says, then six days before the Passover... This is going to be the last of Jesus' public ministry before Israel. And this is the beginning of what week? Passion. The week of his passion. His sacrifice. Where he's going to lay down his life. So it's six days before the Passover. Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, there they made him a supper, and Martha served. That's what she would be doing, right? Now, we, we know from the other Gospels she's in Simon the leper's house. This leper obviously was healed. Um, Mary, Martha, Lazarus have some uh, acquaintance, uh, relationship, uh, fellowship with Simon the leper, and that's why she's at his house helping serve. And that's what Martha's do, Right? But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Now, Lazarus was one of the guests of honor. Why? Because he was the one who raised from the dead. And and you have to know, wouldn't you like to talk to Lazarus? To know what he experienced for those four days that he was in the grave? Hmm? I always get intrigued, and I watch a lot of YouTube uh, videos, and I've, I've read a couple of books on life after death experiences that people have. And it's always a joy to hear the experiences that believers have. It is a frightening thing to hear the experience that unbelievers have. But it would be nice if uh, Lazarus were here to tell us what he experienced for four days. And I'm sure everyone who gathered, everyone who encountered Lazarus after his resurrection wanted to know. And he probably had to tell that story over and over and over again. But I'm sure, I am positive, I am absolutely certain he never got tired of it. You ever get tired of telling the story when Jesus raised you from the dead? I never get tired of telling my testimony. And how the Lord walked into my life one day and changed everything, everything. And so to this uh, Lazarus, he is the guest of honor, I think, here at this celebration. So they made a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one who sat at the table with him, with Jesus, that is. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. Now, uh, This oil is an oil that is produced from a root of a plant that is found in northern India. It's very, very expensive. Uh, It's a a nard oil, and uh, it would cost you to have a pint of this oil, which is about what this flask would be, it would cost you a year's wage. And a lot of women in that day, they would wear a little flask with some of this oil in it around their neck. And it was... Used as a uh, endowment sometimes. It was used as a, uh, uh, an inheritance sometimes, but it was used more often for a burial. And so Mary had this pound of very expensive spikenard, and she was going to anoint Jesus with it. As I said, it's the equivalent of a year's wage. Now, Matthew and Mark both record for us that she not only anointed his feet, she anointed his head. Um, would that be a common practice? 
No? How about Psalm 23? Psalm 23, look at that for a minute. But you all know it already. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. And so when you really wanted to bless someone, even in the Old Testament period, you know, it was common that you gave a blessing and an honor to someone, you would anoint their head with oil. Now, Mary takes upon herself the position of the lowest, lowliest servant in the house by doing what? Washing his feet. And if you know anything about the way they would sup uh, there in that custom, they didn't sit at a table in chairs like we do today. They, it was a, the table would be in a horseshoe. It was called a triclinium. And they would each be reclining on their side. So they would have their front torso towards the table, and they would recline on their left side to eat with their right hand. And their feet would be sticking out away from the table. So it would be very easy for Mary to approach Jesus and begin to remove his sandals and wash his feet. Or anoint them with this precious oil. And then, it's, as I said, the previous text in Matthew and in Mark both indicate for us that she anointed his head as well. Very, very extravagant, public, intimate act of worship. Why is her heart so filled with such adoration and such thanksgiving and such worship of the Lord? He just completely removed all of her grief from just a few days before. Talking to my son before I came this afternoon, and uh, he's just been so busy with a number of people in his fellowship, and he has a large congregation and elderly people who are dying, younger people who have heart attacks, uh, just one thing after another. He said, Dad, I just can't believe it. I've been living in the hospital for a week now, you know. And how grievous it is, isn't it? When someone that we love is, is taken ill, and, and worse yet, when, they, when that illness takes them out of this life. And we know how grieved Mary was when her brother Lazarus died. We can only imagine, right? But you know, those of us who have experienced the death of those that we love, those who have been very, very near and close to us, It's like being torn on in half, isn't it? So the brother would have been absolutely. That's absolutely true, Deborah. They would have asked themselves, "Now, what are we going to do? How can we take care of ourselves?" But Jesus turned that entire situation around when He brought Lazarus back to new life. And how appreciative, how thankful she was in this act of worship displays that. Did he not turn everything around for you and I when he raised us from the dead, spiritual dead? We had no future. What was our destiny prior to that? Yeah. Oh, but now look what he has afforded us. Now, listen, we have no reason to ever be anxious or fearful or worrisome ever again. Because he will provide for us. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you even unto the end of the age. You could have stayed. Do you understand the degree to which he has blessed our life? Preserved us, provided for us, guiding us. This, this act of worship that we're, we're reading about here, that Mary displays is... I, I can't describe it in full. But it's something that every one of us should be experiencing as a result of what he's done for us in wanting to anoint his head, to take on the role of a, of a servant and do whatever it is he asks us to do, to anoint his feet. And Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard and anointed the feet of Jesus. She was always at his feet, wasn't she? The first time, you know, the, the gospel only records three instances where Mary is mentioned. 
That's interesting, isn't it? Only three times. The first time it's in Luke's gospel in chapter 10, and she's there sitting at the feet of Jesus doing what? Being blessed by the word, the words of the Lord, right? The next time she's before Jesus in John chapter 11, and what is she doing then? Giving all her burdens to the Lord. Cast all of your cares upon me. Why? For I care for you. And each time she's sitting at the feet being blessed by the word of the Lord. The next time she sits at the feet of the Lord sharing all of her burdens, crying out with all of her heart for those things that concern her. And now, and now, this last time that we see Mary, she's sitting at the Lord's feet and she's worshiping the Lord. Just as we should relate to Lazarus in being resurrected, to Mary in worshiping, to Martha in serving, so as we see Mary at the feet of Jesus taking in his word. At the feet of Jesus, sharing all of our burdens and our concerns, seven in the morning, seven at night, right? That's the prayer line. But I know you pray even beside that. We're to pray without ceasing. And then lastly, sitting before him in complete adoration, worship, love. And she wiped his feet with her hair. What did her hair represent? Well, don't wonder. Turn to me to 1 Corinthians 11. First Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 12 says, uh, for as woman came from man, even so man also comes through the woman. But all things are from God. Judge among yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? Now, what he's talking about there, uh, there, were, there were men who wore long hair and they were showing all of their reverence and their worship of God in doing so, their devotion to God. Who were they? The Nazarites. The Nazarites would not allow uh, a razor to touch their head. Can you think of any men in the Bible who had long hair and were known for their long hair? Samson. Absalom, Samson. Right, right. Those are two in particular. John the Baptist would have probably been very long hair as he was a Nazarite, you know? given to the Lord from childhood. But what this text is telling you is that a man should not wear his hair or or even apparel that would give indication that he looks like a woman. Or a woman should not wear her hairstyle or wear apparel that makes her have the appearance of a man. A man should not look like a woman. A woman should not look like a man. There shouldn't be any confusion as to your gender. Hmm? That's a problem today, isn't it? Wow. (laughs) But he goes on to say, verse 15 in particular, but if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given to her for a covering. Now, a woman didn't necessarily have to wear a covering or a shawl if she had long hair. And that's that's pretty uh, consistent throughout a lot of the cultures in the East. When I was in uh, India for some time, uh, and we would go to church, the men would sit on one side of the church, the women on the other. But men would always wear a head covering. And the women most often did, but they all had long hair. And the long hair is believed to be their glory. I can remember Josephine, my grandmother. She always I was, it amazed me that when uh, I would see her getting ready to go to bed for the evening, then she would let down her hair, and it always amazed me how much hair she had. But you never knew she had this beautiful long hair during the day because it was always held up. Well, a Jewish woman would never, ever, ever let her hair down publicly, ever. 
except when? At night for her husband. She would allow her husband to see the beauty of her long hair. Right? And that would be the only time. It, it, would be, it would be considered disgraceful for a woman to let down her hair, her long hair, in public. But that Mary is not doing anything disgraceful. She is giving her glory to the Lord. Who should get the glory, beloved? We, we live in a day and time when the church is so, what I call, anthropocentric, man-centered. Too many men, unfortunately women as well, taking the glory that belongs to the Lord alone. Isn't that true? Did you see that list of heretics we sent out? Amazing, isn't it? It's even more amazing is the gullible people that support them. To where they gain so much wealth temporarily in this society, but they're stealing the glory of the Lord. One of the most gross displays of that, stealing God's glory, would be Benny the Hindu. You know Benny Hinn with the do? <laughs> when he was a younger man, <laughs> he had that, that, that do. When you would go to a Benny Hinn healing crusade, they would uh, get the crowd all worked up with some high energy you know, worship. And once they got you worked up emotionally and, and all of these people in this crazed zeal without knowledge, that's the unfortunate part about it. It's really, it's, it's emotionalism and it's zeal where there is no knowledge, though. And in the height of all of that, all of the lights in the stadium would go out. And then one bright light would shine on the podium where Benny Hinn would come out and begin and share. And as he's coming up from the back, he's in this white, you know, you've seen him with those white suits before. I don't know how he keeps them so clean. But anyway, you know, I had mustard stains all over my shirt from Saturday. But, <laughs> but he comes out, and that spotlight is radiating completely on him. And you know what song is being played? How Great Thou Art. No understanding on God's prohibition to not touch his kabod, his glory. You are not to touch the glory of God. But look on how many personality cults are there out today. Mary. Mary was offering any glory that she might have to the Lord by letting down her hair and, and drying his feet, wiping his feet and anointing them and washing them with her tears, tears of joy, tears of thanksgiving, tears of appreciation, tears of love. Lord, I want to cry more. 1980, in the summer of 1980 is when I first got saved. Well, I first recognized God's election in my life. And I cried for six months. Tears of joy, but I cried. I mean, I just, I just seemed to cry everywhere. At the drop of a hat, I could cry in just appreciation and thanksgiving for what the Lord has done for me. Lord, forgive me. I don't cry as much anymore. Help me to cry more. Back to John 12. So this exchange of glory, giving her glory to the Lord by wiping his feet with her hair. And this, this expression of worship, it was very public, wasn't it? It was very personal between her and the Lord, and intimate. But there was no embarrassment, there was no shame, she, there was no uh, timidity in her at all in expressing her love for Jesus. We should be the same way, shouldn't we? Especially publicly. When I was working uh, for General Electric in my corporate career, when you walked in my office, you very quickly saw there were two things I loved very much. My family and Jesus. You saw pictures of my family, my wife and my son, and then, and then you saw indications that I loved Jesus. I had a Bible on my desk. I had a poster that, that was uh, with my life's verse on it. Uh, and so that was my passion. And I was, I'm not ashamed 
of my love for Jesus. I'm not ashamed of my identity with Jesus. My wife can tell you wherever we go, the first thing I want to talk about, the first thing I try to engage people in is a conversation about Jesus. We, we want our worship of Jesus to be unashamed, not to be intimidated by the world at all, but to show the world how much we love him. You uh, husbands and wives, when you first met each other, you weren't ashamed, were you? You couldn't wait to tell everybody about the special someone that you met, you know? And, and how we should do the same in our relationship with the Lord, our love for the Lord. Uh, the, the world needs to see a, a church that really is impassioned, in love, adoring Jesus, not themselves. Get away from the anthropocentric attitude and go to a Christ-centered, Christ-centric church. We don't have a Christ-centric church anymore. The church isn't Christ-centered, it's, it's man-centered. You understand that, right? But Mary's life was just the opposite. And, and this is an ex- extravagant act of worship, isn't it? I don't know how many of you are going to be moved so much that this Sunday you're going to give us a year's wage. <laughs> We're not. But isn't that amazing that that's what she did? Now, to Deborah's point, if Lazarus was still in the grave, her and Martha would be in a very difficult situation. No way to care for themselves. Widows and orphans would be left to whatever the... Uh, Society wanted to give them, to offer them. It's a wonderful thing when the Lord moves into your heart and you express an extravagant love by not giving a year's wage. No, no, no. He wants far more than that, doesn't he? But by giving your entire life, everything. That making him number one in your life, the first passion of your life. Yes, Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. There's a lot of women who spend an awful lot of money on their hair, don't they, and hair products? And I don't, I mean, that's a good thing. I mean, if you, you can afford it and you're not being ridiculous about it. I, I, lo- I think women should do everything they can to look as beautiful as they can, right? And men should do what they can, what they, what they got left, to be as handsome as they can, you know? <laughs> but can you imagine now you uh, go before the Lord and are his feet clean? No. No. His feet have been soiled. He took quite a, quite a trek from where he was to where he is now. And in the process, his feet would get very dirty. And so not only is her tears being, uh, causing all of that grit and dirt and soil to be more fluid, uh, not only is that oil being mixed with that, that dirt and filth from the street, Now, she takes what would be her glory and she wipes all of that dirt off of his feet. All of that oil, all of that filth. Isn't that quite amazing for a woman to do that? Again, they they believe that their hair, their long hair was their glory. Are you willing to get down into the muck and the mire of life? We're supposed to be a hospital, right? For sinners? A way station? And, and sometimes people come in and they're not what we think the norm. But we need to get into the muck and the filth and the dirt and sometimes get a little dirty ourselves in the process and put aside our own vain glory and pride. I want to encourage many of you. You know, I, I uh, sometimes uh, I like watching the service afterwards because I like to watch the meet and greet. 
And I'm always amazed at how many of you regulars don't, don't uh, engage new people in our fellowship. You like to speak to those who you know and you're comfortable with, but you're very unlikely to get outside of your comfort zone to meet someone new. What are you afraid of? You're going to get dirty? No. I want to encourage you from now on, on a Sunday morning, because I'm going to be watching. (laughs) Stop greeting the people you greet every single Sunday and start meeting the people who God has brought here to be a part of our communion. And then very soon, they'll be regulars, and then you'll have to go greet some other people who come into our communion. But it becomes, uh, and, and I don't know if anybody, anybody else ever observed this, or am I the only one? No, it's true, yeah. And we get very clickish. Get out of the clickishness. If you start moving out to meet those people, if you start moving out and be a little uncomfortable, you're wiping his feet with your hair, aren't you? In a sense. Yes, of course you are. Um, I don't think I want to go any further in this text. I have a lot to share when we get there. Probably in another uh, week from Sunday. But suffice it to say, there's enough for us to meditate on, to muse over. You were Lazarus. You're dead. And now we're alive. Amen? And now, and now in response to that, and there's like, sit and before you come forward tonight, sit and think about all that his death and resurrection has afforded you, has given you, the graces he has blessed you with. And then when you come up here, you come up with a heart of worship, of Eucharisteo, of thanksgiving, to adore him to worship him, to surrender completely to him. And then after we commit these acts of worship tonight, then let's purpose to serve him. Let's go out and become Martha's and serve the Lord. So we need to stay at his feet to receive of the word. We come before him and lay at his feet with all of our burdens and our cares, our heartaches, but we also come to him in worship, knowing that he cares for us and we can cast every care, great or small, and he will answer according to our need. Amen. 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 Let's pray.